Firstly, I would like to thank our virtual trade sponsor, Harfang IP. Their advertisement has been going on on our stage live during the entire duration of the conference. You all can just go to the stage and check it out. So now we are going to move ahead with the specialized presentation sponsored by Harfang IP. And the topic of which is transparency in brand licensing. The speakers of which are Curtis Todd, Chief Intellectual Property Officer, Harfang IP, and Chris Jibuk, Founder, President, and CEO, I guess, Harfang IP. So over to you guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, we appreciate uh, the opportunity to participate in this forum. Um, we also want to thank the audience for joining us. Um, as uh, introduced, uh, myself and, and Kurt are going to be uh, presenting uh, for this session. Uh, Kurt and I uh, are with IP, uh, and we've been working together for quite some time before that. Uh, we both uh, work uh, for, for Nortel and then uh, YLAN, where we were doing the licensing of uh, wireless technology, Wi-Fi-related patents. Uh, we also work together at Acacia and more recently at uh, Longhorn IP, also doing licensing of uh, wireless technologies. We've been uh, focusing and we are focusing now at RFIP on standard essential patents, SCPs, and on the fair and reasonable, fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory, uh, what we call FRAN licensing of these patents. That's the framework that's uh, used uh, in that has been used in 2G, 3G, 4G, and, and, and now 5G. Uh, so our focus is more on the wireless technology. And as we go through the presentation, we'll pay us, uh, particular attention to uh, the wireless technology. And today, our, the topic of our session is uh, transparency in friends, friend licensing. We're going to talk about what we're hearing from different entities in the friend community about uh, transparency. We're going to see how that uh, lines up with uh, the law. And uh, we're going to also address uh, at the end uh, what should be done moving forward, for instance, uh, for uh, the 5G technology that's just being rolled out. So without further ado, um, as a starting point, Kurt, uh, what do we even mean by transparency? Again, uh, I think Rosemary has mentioned something on the chat. Perhaps you can start by sharing what is FRAND licensing. So she's not familiar to that. I think Kurt is here. All right. Sorry. I don't know what happened. Chris, you hung on me, and then I, I got kicked out. <clears throat> All right. Uh, maybe uh, we can address uh, the question very quickly about what is uh, FRAND licensing. As I was uh, discussing, FRAND is uh, the framework that is used to license standard essential patents that are used, uh, particularly in the world of um, cellular communication, so 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. Um, it stands for fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. So um, it, it, the standard setting organization uh, uh, requests that uh, People participating in participating in participating in the standard uh, accept to license any intellectual property that is or may become essential on friend terms, and also if any additional intellectual property is identified, uh, it will request uh, uh, the um, commitment that the patent owners are going to license also on friend terms. So Kurt, uh, do you want to uh, share the presentation from your side or? Um, sure. So uh, uh, just to get back to where we were, Kurt, uh, I was uh, asking you, uh, what does uh, transparency even mean? <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. Um, first, you know, I'm not aware of any general legal definition of the term transparency. Uh, for example, I took a look in Black's Law Dictionary and it doesn't appear there. <clears throat> excuse me, nor does transparency uh, defined by the by ETSI, which is the standard organization supporting the development of cellular standards. Uh, the word transparency does not show up in the, the 
the main document involved regarding intellectual property, which is the Etsy IPR policy. And although the term transparency does appear in the Etsy guide on IPRs, it's actually used in a, a different context, not FRAN licensing like we're discussing today. Okay, so despite this, though, several FRAN statements made by entities in the FRAN licensing ecosystem have made reference to transparency, though, right? Correct. Um, but that being said, there doesn't appear to be much consensus as to what transparency means. Okay. So how is transparency being interpreted? Uh, unfortunately, we do not have enough time today to go through all the individual statements that uh, different companies have on their websites and, and in different position papers. Uh, for an or overview of those, uh, we'll direct the audience to a paper that you and I co-authored that appeared in IP Watchdog called Cellular Wireless Standard Essential Patents, a survey of FRAN-related statements. Um, but to make a long story short, there's basically two main areas of disagreement. One, with respect to the use of agreements to maintain confidentiality, that could be a non-disclosure agreement or even within a license itself. Uh, and two, with respect to what information needs to be provided by the licensor and when. So with respect to uh, the first point there, the use uh, of agreements to maintain confidentiality, it's not a, as simple as uh, some are for and some are against it, right? Correct. Uh, it's a little more nuanced and, and situation specific than that. Uh, for example, the Fair Standards Alliance, uh, who counts amongst its members, Apple and Google and Microsoft, for example, um, they argue against the use of uh, agreements to maintain confidentiality, and the idea being that they can share offers and agree to rates amongst their members. Yet at the same time, you see their members' negotiations being kept confidential in litigation. Uh, for example, if you look at their, the record for Optus versus Apple, uh, you'll see that much, is, uh, much has been redacted. Um, other statements from other companies like Motorola Solutions uh, make an interesting observation, which is, you know, if a license can only be shared on a confidential basis, uh, use of a non-disclosure agreement can, in fact, increase transparency. And it, it's also good to to keep in mind that uh, it, it takes two to tango uh, when it comes to uh, confidentiality. Uh, in other words, the, the confidentiality is not something that uh, the licensor can impose unilaterally on the licensee. Um, now, with respect to what to provide and when, uh, it seems that the implementer community has been a lot more vocal than the SCP owner community in terms of what is required. For instance, uh, the Fair Standard Alliance, uh, also referred to as the FSA, uh, has advocated for the disclosure of not only the signed license agreements, but also offers prior to those agreements. So uh, not only limited to litigation and arbitration, but during negotiation as well. Correct. Um, I think the relative silence from the licensor community is perhaps reflective of their uh, uncertainty as to what exactly does need to be disclosed and when, but suffice to say, if you look through, uh, again, the dockets and the records for various litigations involving SCPs, standard essential patents, you know, one thing's clear, is that the licensor community doesn't agree with the expansive views of the FSA. Okay, so next, uh, what, what does the law say about transparency? Um, first of all, as a matter of contract law, um, the, the Etsy licensing declaration simply refers to granting licenses to essential IPR on friend terms and conditions, right? Correct. So if you consider that <clears throat> the declaration that's made to the standards body is a contract which implementers can benefit from as a, as a third party beneficiary, if you look at the language of that contract, there's nothing in there about proving uh, that the terms offered are being, excuse me, the terms that are being offered are in fact friend, uh, certainly no requirement to do so in, in pre-litigation negotiations. Um, if you look at the case out of Texas, uh, HTC versus Ericsson, Judge Rodney Gilstrap found as a matter of French law uh, that one who submits such a licensing de declaration can satisfy its obligations by offering a license on FRAN terms and conditions mm -hmm. or negotiating in good faith uh, towards a FRAN license. But again, nothing about having to prove that you're doing so. 
I also know that uh, the use of non-disclosure agreements in licensing negotiation is is uh, explicitly recognized in the guide, the Etsy guide on intellectual property. It's saying in, in section 4.4, and I quote, this general practice is not challenged. Uh, like many things, it appears that Etsy, and by that I mean the cellular industry at large, uh, has left issues of transparency to be intentionally to be resolved by the national courts. Okay, so if there is no contractual requirement uh, to be transparent, how else uh, could there be transparency? Uh, how, how else could that be legally required? Uh, presumably, it would have to be a matter of, of antitrust laws, as we call them in the United States, or competition laws in Europe. I think China refers to them as anti-monopoly laws, but basically the same idea. Laws that are there to pre prevent uh, unfair competition. Um, if you look at one case uh, that, that touches on friend issues from an antitrust perspective or a competition law perspective, uh, Phillips versus Asus out of the Netherlands, there the Dutch Court of Appeal found that the Huawei versus ZTE framework set forth by the Courts of Justice of the European Union uh, and involves what needs to be done by a standard essential patent owner so as not to abuse its dominant position when seeking an injunction, uh, there's no substantiation duty. Again, there's no obligation to prove that the offer you are making as a licensor or patent owner uh, is friend, for example, by having to disclose all prior licenses. Uh, interestingly, Phillips was not even required to disclose its prior licenses in the litigation. Uh, the Dutch Court of Appeal characterizing ASUS's request in the circumstances as an unauthorized fishing expedition. And again, it's worth noting that the Etsy declaration itself is governed by uh, European law. Now, from the U.S. perspective, uh, law professor Mark Patterson, whose article we referred to in our article, uh, says that based on other industries' practices, the use of confidentiality agreements is likely not a per se violation, meaning uh, they're not anti-competitive in and of themselves. Rather, if someone was to bring an antitrust type claim, they'd have to show how competition was negatively impacted as a result of such agreements. And uh, Professor Patterson, uh, you know, makes a very astute point, which is the obligation to license on Fran terms and conditions can be met without proving you're doing so. Based on the other commercial practices that that we say that we see day to day, it's also hard to see how transparency could be a requirement in antitrust uh, law. For instance, you know, when you walk into a car dealership. Uh, the car dealership is not expected to provide you with the pricing that they've offered to every uh, every other customers that they've had before you, and that doesn't appear to be an anti antitrust violation. So, uh, I, I think even in general, you know, many businesses would have a, a difficult time um, uh, if if full pricing transparency would be required. So, um, moving on to the, the next uh, topic, is transparency a one or a two way street? Um, so, so far it seems like uh, we have only talked about the SCP owner's obligation to be transparent, but what about the licensees? Uh, for instance, uh, the Japanese Patent Office published a guide to licensing negotiations involving SCPs that proposes a mutual transparency obligation as part of a, the broader obligation to negotiate in good faith. It's saying that implementers shouldn't simply say that they don't infringe, but should explain why. And implementers shouldn't simply say that an offer is not friend, but explain why, for instance, using other licenses that they've entered into. Right, and, and if you consider the rules of civil procedure in discovery jurisdictions like the United States and Canada um, as an analog, um, and these rules are also there to foster a measure of transparency, two things jump out at you. Um, first of all, the transparency obligation is reciprocal. Uh, and second, um, pr providing discovery comes with a guarantee that the other party can't simply walk away as they can in the negotiation. Yeah, and I'm, I, I must say as a licensor, uh, you know, we would be a, a lot more comfortable sharing additional information if we knew that the uh, result would be guaranteed and we'd be also more willing to reconsider pricing if we had access to other licenses, com comparable licenses that the licensee may have entered into. 
So um, next, uh, what, what's really going on here? Uh, it's similar to vice crimes, in my opinion, like like gambling. And when it comes to confidentiality, it appears that people tend to say one thing and do another. Uh, in other words, as you know, my parents often said, uh, do as I say, not as I do. Um, but again, all you need to do is look at the various cases like Unwired Planet and others, uh, and you'll see that the industry apparently prefers to negotiate confidentially. Right, because at the end of the day, it is uh, to an implementer's advantage if they can pay less than their competitors or if uh, they can pay one licensor less than another licensor for comparable patents. Correct, but they certainly don't want to pay more than anyone else or their competitors. So hence the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde routine on the one hand, you know, show me everything. But on the other hand, let's keep my negotiations and agreement confidential when the time comes. So, you know, for many, it appears, Chris, that uh, transparency is just, you know, the latest uh, and yet another excuse for holdout. And uh, it seems to be based on this flawed assumption that the patent owner carries uh, the burden of proof and must assume all risks of un uncertainty. Um, but again, I take you back to the um, HTC and Ericsson case in Texas and the uh, uh, Phillips versus Asus case in, in Europe. Uh, there's, there's no such burden of proof, at least not that we've been made aware of thus far. Um, and you'll see this reflected in Lenovo's recent antitrust complaint against Interdigital. Uh, it claims that Interdigital, quote, tilts negotiations improperly in its favor to a massive and disproportionate imposition of transaction costs, uh, specifically by not identifying the patents that individual believes are essential. But it begs the question, you know, why isn't Lenovo responsible for conducting its own analysis if it wants friend licenses? In other words, why does Interdigital have to show its hand if Lenovo can simply walk away and require Interdigital to prove its case in court? I, I also find that uh, particularly worrying this argument that uh, the so-called over-declarations to Etsy uh, contributes to the problem that uh, there being a, a lack of transparency and, and this argument being used as a justification for suggesting radical changes. For instance, uh, the European Commission uh, expert report suggesting that uh, there be an independent body determining in essentiality. Uh, the Etsy database uh, was not intended to be a list of essential patents. In fact, it, the purpose was to avoid a patented technology being incorporated in the standard without a friend licensing commitment. So it actually, it's actually beneficial for the Etsy and the industry at large to, that uh, they receive more declarations to license more patents on friend terms. Um, so uh, finally, uh, what would help? Uh, yeah, as we discussed uh, with respect to the Japanese Patent Office um, guidelines and, and you know the rules of civil procedure, it seems like a reciprocal disclosure obligation uh, is a good place to start as part of the broader obligations to negotiate in good faith. Um, you know, perhaps courts should be suspicious of, of friend claims or defenses uh, seeking to justify a holdout based on transparency issues if access to that information could have been had in, in arbitration, for example. Um, but beyond that, it seems to be letting the industry and the courts and competition, competition agencies work out the appropriate approach using uh, the existing legal frameworks uh, makes the most sense to me. Right. So there is no need to make radical ch changes to a system that's been working well for, you know, many prior generations of, of cellular technologies. Um, so... Um, Let's uh, see if, uh, if there are any questions from the audience. Um, there was one that came earlier during the presentation. Uh, is friend only used for patents or other IP as well? Um, I, as far as I know, friend is uh, very much of a patent uh, concept. Kurt, have you heard of a friend being used anywhere else? Well, it's interesting. I, I've set my uh, I set up an alert through Lexis. Uh, Lexus Advance, and um, occasionally I do get friend articles and things popping up uh, with respect to like the supply of commodities, like selling gas 
uh, are, are supplying you know natural gas and things like that uh, also in, involving rents you know rent control in different places uh, again it's a pretty broad concept you know it's, it's fair and reasonable uh, and then non-discriminatory means you know you have to treat everybody more or less the same it doesn't mean identical but certainly you know you can't be discriminatory uh, towards one person charge them ten times as much as somebody else for example all right, any other questions from uh, the audience? We have one question from Vanchuj. Uh, I hope we answered or not. Is it only used for patents or other IP as well? Please feel free to take this at the end of the session. So I hope we answered that. Yes. Yeah, no, that, that, was, that was the question I just answered that you do see this popping up in other places beyond. Uh, patents, but certainly in our world uh, of telecommunications, this is the main the main place it appears. So, any more questions, audience? It was an interesting presentation, I would say. And any questions that are coming up from the these, they can write down on the chat box. They can also come online directly and join face to face with the speakers to ask them directly. And in the meanwhile, over to you, Ankit. The smiles. So by the time the audience, if they have any questions, just type it down in the chat box or come up live. So Curtis, so, if you would like to conclude this session in just one minute, so it would be great. True. Nobody told us we were signing up to be models. That's, that's not uh, how we specialize in. Well, again, we would like to thank you for the opportunity to uh, be speaking at the conference and, and thank the audience. Uh, for um, joining us today. And if you have any more questions about Fran, uh, you can consult our website. There's also a lot of websites out there that specialize in the Fran issues. Um, it's a, a, fascinating, a fascinating world. Absolutely. And the interesting thing is that we would also be promoting their presentation on our website for the next few months. So it'll be great that if you can have a look and as we have so many followers, you know, following for the IP at Gorilla, so they can look forward to have, you know, and reach out to her fan IP. Thank so you. Rosemary says, thank you for the interesting presentation. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. All righty then. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.